people, and welcome to the newest episode of the Noobs and Knockouts podcast. I'm Austin. I'm a knockout. Watched a lot of wrestling. I'm David. I'm a noob. I haven't watched a whole lot of wrestling. Um, I am damn excited to be watching more today, though, because we are in my favorite place of all time. Yes, we have returned to Boyle Heights. It's been a long. It's been it's been longer than usual for that because we had some had some extra stuff to do along the way. But we are back. <laughs> Solid like month Heights. and a half, right? Yeah, six weeks Dang. will be by the time this drops. It'll be six weeks between our oh. Lucha Underground episodes. Oh, you know it's been too long, my love. Don't cry for me, Boyle <laughs> Heights. Yeah, uh, I expect it's gonna be a good one today. So, what do we have? Uh, I guess to cover back some some of what happened last time. Mm-hmm. Um. We had uh, the mystery of, of the the K of the person in the cage in the basement. <laughs> not 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 the Brian cage, not the machine. No, it's um, different. No, a different a different cage, an actual literal cage, a not mm-hmm. a, a presumably not a mechanical one, uh, considering the big fuck off key that that uh, Dario Cueto has to open it, um, but a cage nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And we have revealed that everything that he swore that he didn't know about. Uh, Black, what Black Lotus is doing? Total lie. He knows everything of it. She's she. He knows exactly what she's looking. <gasps> for. What a what a scumbag! Scandalous. You're telling me mm-hmm. Dario Quaid is a liar? Never. Yes, in a in an episode filled with choking, uh, ah. we had uh, the continued flirtation of 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 um uh, of uh, Katrina. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, Mackin on uh, Phoenix, and uh, while still while uh, Mil Muertes is real mad because he lost to Phoenix like a loser. Um, look, if, uh, um, Muertes is really, uh, r- really wants to make sure that he's the only one who can take uh, Katrina's breath away. Okay. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Well, and then one of the only things that was explicitly advertised for this episode beforehand is is Mil Muertes took Chavo Guerrero's breath away in the hallway. <laughs> and so true. we are going to have uh, Mil Muertes versus Chavo Guerrero on this uh, set of episodes we're doing today. Yes. Then uh, Johnny Mundo came back and was immediately uh, set upon by, by King Cuerno dispatched he, so we, we will undoubtedly see more of that as, as as the hunter is trying to hunt a guy who just wears furs does he doesn't have he's not an animal person yeah has someone checked like Querno's eyesight behind that mask like i didn't think he'd be having a sincara problem but but like may, maybe he just like needs to get some glasses you know yeah, he just sees fur and goes red and just assumes that, <laughs> and assumes that's what i he was looking for Cuerno, Cuerno. Just imagining like Johnny Mundo, like 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 waving his his pelt in front of Cuerno. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it works like that. Something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um. There was. I I just re-listened to our episode, and I should have written down all the stuff that happened. There was a oh, lot. Of well, there, there's the there's the there's the big one. There's the big big one that made me really happy. With oh yes, yeah, so Alberto uh, El Alberto Patron. El Patron. He debuted. The artist and formerly Im- known as Alberto Del Rio. And he was immediately attacked by Tejano. There is his AAA rival, and we will definitely see some uh, follow up on that. I am so excited. Uh, honestly. That I'm I I was I was wondering like you know I, I I mused on this in our last episode like why I was so hyped to see Del Rio and part of it is like kind of this realization after the context you gave me of like oh it's gonna be good to see him like unequivocally treated well in this uh mm-hmm. show after he's been kind of like this oafish um rich guy heel in in uh WWE like he'll actually be treated with respect but I think I'm really excited too to see him as a legitimate full-on face because the only time we've seen him as a face he was still playing de facto heel in the christmas episode so i yeah, what am, am, again i will never get over the fact that he'll turn alberto del rio then one week later they do the christmas episode and have him run over santa claus wait you mean I, face turn yeah and he yeah. turned face one week before that christmas episode and then the next week they just go back to him being a face we don't talk about the christmas thing 
yeah, the the cano the, the the canonical validity of the Christmas episode we don't talk about. Anyway, yeah, no, I'm I'm excited to see him do like legitimately like face work. Um because he showed off in that episode he has the charisma for it. So I'm really excited to see kind of what comes of that. Mm -hmm. Uh Son of Havoc showed off his chops as a mm. as a oh my God. figure. Oh no, I I still have so many conflicting feelings about this. I, I would like to believe you'll have less conflicted feelings as time goes on. I'm sure I will. Because I I love I came to love Son of Havoc by the time I got into Lucha Underground as it was airing. Because he he works really well as a baby face. I gotta say, I, I I and I'm sure I've remarked on on this before. I really get a kick out of all the little things like that I must say, like, in, in the beginning of when we kind of start up arcs and stuff like that, that'll pay off in some way later that you're just so able to, like, poker face bite your tongue about while it's sitting there going, hey, 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 hey. It is, when it I remarked is. early on about how, like, oh, God, Son of Havoc seems really fucking annoying and I don't like him. Um, I'll be like, oh, but you will. <laughs> <laughs> And no, uh, that's that's kind of my job on this podcast is is to is I have to like poker face my way through whatever it is David is 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 theorizing about or musing about. I have to sit there and be like, ah, oh, but you don't. But I see the future. <laughs> I am psychic, baby. And then uh, speaking of stuff that I have to sit bite my tongue on, Pentagon Jr. has started breaking people's arms mm -hmm. in sacrifice to his dark master. Yeah. Greatest character in Lucha Underground. Oh, I, 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 he's not my personal favorite character, but I deeply appreciate everything that he is. Um, and if Austin likes him this much, like my one worry is like, that the back breaking motif may start to get a little stale for me. But if Austin is this big a fan of him, that indicates to me that they, that they kind of evolve the act uh, enough to keep it fresh. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that continues to kind of play. They do. Out. He has a, he has a great arc across the first two seasons of this show. Ooh. Oh, good TV quality, quality wrestling TV, the mm -hmm. best. Oh my God. Yep. For great times. And then, Ah, yes, Big Rick is presumably back. The first episode we're watching today is called Eye for an Eye, so I would assume it's it's about that guy who lost an eye. <laughs> there once was a guy who lost an eye. Yep. Uh, he he had his he had his confessional promo. Oh I oh we, god. We almost forgot about it last time, and that's sad because I actually enjoyed that a lot. That it's it, it was like it was corny but in the best possible way mm -hmm. that's that's what i love about lucha it gets so corny and so ridiculous but like they they're, they're somehow able to keep you buying into it because it's just fun yeah it reminded me of like uh in daredevil season one right before matt murdoch agrees to like put on a mask and start kicking the shit out of people as a vigilante. He does the exact same thing. He like goes to his, his, his priest and asks him about like, can God, can, am I allowed to do a confessional for things I haven't done yet, but I'm <laughs> going to do. Um, it was, it was really it was his Matt Murdoch's relationship with his priest on that show. Really fascinating stuff. But we're not here to talk about daredevil. Oh God! Uh, yet another, uh, yet another one of our our spinoff shows. We talk about Marvel, but only the Netflix shows. Oh God! Oh God! Honestly, honestly, that that would be that would be pretty manageable. To the me. epic highs pretty and pretty lows of not high, not high school football, but Netflix. Marvel. I I I've I've been formulating in my head because it's me. Um, future merch that I want us to have. Um, and one of the things I want is a shirt that's like um the the real spin-off show will be and then just like a blank below it um <laughs> fill in whatever you want no nah. we, we'll we, we keep we keep pitching spin-off shows <laughs> we need a spin-off show for theor for 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 theorizing about potential spin-off shows <laughs> to meta <laughs> Hey, hey, if kayfabe can do it, so can I, all right? All right. 
Well, that is about what we need to cover for this episode. We will be back at you with uh, episodes season one, episode 15, and season one, episode 16. Before I go, I'm going to say, where could you watch these episodes if you'd like to watch? Uh, the answer, Tubi.tv. To, excuse me, TubiTV.com, excuse me. That, it is like Netflix, but it's free. Obviously, they don't have all the same stuff as Netflix, of course. But there's a lot of there's some good content on there, and most importantly, all of Lucha Underground is all in there. of Lucha Underground. Yep. The, the wrestling gods have smiled on us this day, um, and said no to the ever looming peacock. Yes. But for now, it is it is uh, 100% for free. You just have to make an account. There are ads, but the ads aren't that intrusive, in my mm -hmm. opinion. And uh, with that, we'll see you guys in the back half. <laughs> and we are back. We have just finished uh, episodes uh, 15 and 16 of season one of Lucha Underground. Oh, boy, that was a lot of good stuff. I mean, it's Lucha. Of course, it was a lot of good stuff. But oh, my God. That was just one banger after another. Damn. Oh, yeah, a lot. There's a lot. There was a lot of good stuff to talk about on this episode. On this yeah, episode. it 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 felt really cool. Um, this one, I think, more than uh some some of the previous episodes we watched. Um, it felt like it had this like really perpetual motion to it. Um, it it jumping between storylines never felt like it kind of stopped the action everything for these two episodes kind of felt like it was just going and going and going and it was really cool to have that sense of momentum throughout i think mm -hmm. definitely uh where do you want to start with this oh my god i don't even i, I don't even know first of all i, I guess i kind of want to start with like these two episodes like we've obviously seen this throughout but these two episodes really, really go in on highlighting the backstage machinations of Dario, of all the moving parts he has going at the same time to, like, kind of do his evil villain wrestling boss shtick um, to, to, to full fruition of, of uh, just, just getting the most entertainment he can for the audience while just out of what seems to be nothing but spite, screwing over as many of his wrestlers as he can in the process. Yeah, so we, so I guess you want to start with the sexy star bit then. I, I, I want to start with it all because, because mm -hmm. first of all, he's we see him with the crew and he's literally telling them, I'm so glad you guys got rid of Big Rick. I love the way you got rid of Big Rick. Now do a hit job on sexy star uh, Pimpinella and Masquerita Cigarata. Um, because I think they're freaks and I don't like them. Okay. He, the, the, he, he, Dario got really mad that when he was like, my temple is open to everyone, that people took that seriously. Yeah. He doesn't, he didn't want, uh, strong independent women, mini wrestlers, and drag queens around here. Yeah. <laughs> Even though, even though the crowd like eats them up, that's what that's what's really interesting to to me about Dario is they don't play him straight up like a like a an extra cartoony Vince McMahon who's like you know beholden to the audience or at least kind of like what people will perceive of like Vince McMahon or a Vince McMahon type. Um, he's not just beholden to like audience demand. Oh no, he has his own personal vendettas that he just throws into the mix for the hell of it. Um, he is legitimately evil, and that's what's that's what's so fun about him is that he's just like maniacal, um, and he will do whatever it takes to to just just create the thing that he finds the most like personally entertaining and like rewarding, I guess, in his wrestling temple. Mm -hmm. um, oh my god! So yeah, so he sends the crew to do a hit job. Um, he he has a cage burst into his office like i want a i want a, 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 a i want the title damn it i well, I, I deserve well, first the title. he demands to be to be called to be declared the the lucha underground champion yeah exactly the fact that he did not beat puma he just ripped his belt and then stole the broken belt 
is not legally how you know pos- this is in wrestling uh possession is not nine tenths of the law he is not yeah. he's not lucha underground champion just because he has the belt <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah um so he demands to be declared and dario's like i can't do that like there's there's only uh, there's only so much he can do behind the scenes before it like just becomes blatantly obvious that he's pulling shady shit so he's like i can't do that but what i can do is i can set you up with a non-title match against puma uh and if you if you win that that makes you heir apparent to the throne because you are everything i want in a in a in a lucha champion and like Mm -hmm. okay uh and then we have a little side thing where um, where 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 ultimate bastard Char- Chavo Guerrero bursts into his office and is like, I quit for some reason. Um, yeah, after he's he's had enough of this dumb bullshit. Yeah, after the Milmuer, after the, the dumb bullshit being ass. being getting dicked on by Milmuertes, um, because Milmuertes has jealousy issues. Um, well, which well, I think we can come back even, to that. Wait, wait, yeah, 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 we'll come back to that. Um, and and then sexy star later on. Uh, so sexy star like gets her. To, I feel like you have to explain the the main event of fi- episode. 15 yeah, the the main event. Of ep- the, the main event of episode fifteen. We'll, we'll I'll summarize it here, and then we can go in more in depth. But the main event of episode fifteen, you know, sees the the crew go up against sexy star, Pimpinella, and Masquerita Cigarata. Um, and uh, the crew co- completely, um, completely trounces on Pimpinella and Masquerita, like. As, as sexy put it, they said they got sent to the hospital. The crew goes, the crew wails on them because it's a, it is a no DQ match. Anything goes. Yeah. It's um, explicit. So, the explicit goal of the match for the crew is they're supposed to like put them out of commission. Yeah. Forever. So, so sexy is doing her best to take three on one. Uh, and then big Rick of course shows up, uh, and gets the crew to run away and, and, you know, forfeit the match. Um, and sexy then is in Dario's office being like, um, I am tired of men coming to save me, which I can't think of too many times of that happening. Like it happened probably in like, in like Aztec warfare here and maybe a couple other places I'm forgetting. I ha- um, I'd have to go back through her match list yeah. for me to know how often that happens. But, but either way, she, she's, she's not having it. And he's like, okay. Um, well, she, I, th- I, she, I think she had, I think she got saved by Phoenix at least once. Oh, that, yeah. Was, yeah. Back when she was dicking around with Chavo Guerrero. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but, but either way, um, she, She's like, she's like, no, nah, no, nah, none of that. So, so Dario goes, um, okay, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you big Rick. She's like, I don't want big Rick. I want the crew. He's like, no, 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 let hear me out. If, uh, you, you, you and big Rick will fight. And then whoever wins that fight, will get to go up against the crew. Uh, so if you can, if you can take out big Rick, that means you can take out the crew. No problem. Cause big Rick's able, big Rick's clearly able to take out the crew. No problem. Um, and I promise no men will come into the ring to help you in that time. And yeah, Austin pointed out very specific in his wording. Yeah, he very specifically said that no man will come in to rescue you. Yes. No promises about anything else. Yeah, and, also, and and of course we have we still have the we still have the black lotus thing going on in the background. So just like before we get to that, Dario, before we get to that, yeah, I want to point out that also yeah. about the about the the uh, Dario Cueto with uh, sexy star thing mm-hmm. is that that kind of is such a peak Dario Cueto thing in that. Technically, he does a sit. He does placate Sexy Star in that he gives her a unique opportunity or whatever <laughs> to uh, get a shot at the crew. But this also fulfills his own long running of plans to hurt to take Sexy Star out of action because Sexy Star is a hell of a fighter. But also, Big Rick is ginormous, yes. and so it is absolute. Dario Cueto was at least kind of hoping just a little bit that big rick will do the job that the crew couldn't do which it's so funny to me like the way he uses people in 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 all of his plots because he doesn't like big rick clearly for some reason but he's so but he's he he he's smart enough to know to use big rick as a conduit to take out another one of his targets and he's seen the crew take out big rick before so he's like no problem they can take him out again it's like he's like he'll he'll take he can take out sexy star and the crew take out big rick and i come out the winner yeah yeah it's just his ability to like 4d chess everybody around him is awesome like like 
every like obviously it's not real it's all constructed but the way he's written and the way he's performed too like it never feels too hokey it never feels too over the top it just it legitimately like like i i know that there's a kayfabe here i know that of course dario cueto is just an actor um, and whoever is actually running Lucha Underground is an invisible figure, yada yada. But I, there's something in my mind that doesn't quite make that connection. Whenever we watch this damn show, he feels like the real boss, um, and that is a huge compliment to the writing and the acting. Um, and it, it's so cool that it feels to me when we're in the moment like this super villain is legitimately running this underground fight club it's awesome mm -hmm. i believe his beef with big rick comes from um him failing to deal to do the job with mundo on mundo back in the first few episodes when it was all about the hundred thousand dollars which even more than that like like, Big Rick was being used to take out Mundo, and now he's using other proxies to take out Mundo. But the, but he, he'll also, like, as soon as somebody fails him once, they are disposable to him. It's, it's, I, I just so, so, so appreciate um, the, the, the little attention to detail in the writing of, like, just these many plots he has going at the same time and how they all kind of interweave without it ever feeling too messy. Um, again... I will never stop praising the writing on this show. Um, their ability to keep things tight continues to be exemplary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This is this episode has a lot of Dario Cueto doing a whole lot of lot of shenanigans, and it works really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these two episodes in general. Mm -hmm. And then, but then the other the other thing that's related to Dario and his backstage shenanigans is we get the Black Lotus plot. Mm -hmm. across two episodes they give they do a whole lot of cliffhanger work yeah um which there's a lot of cool stuff uh with this uh, like 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 okay the teases i was i was like i was getting frustrated at um because like you know she's sneaking around and then she opens the door cut to commercial and then she goes up to the cage I've wanted to kill you ever since I was a child. Cut to commercial. Um, and then, like, she gets bagged and thrown in a trunk. Cut to commercial. Like, but, but I do feel legitimate suspense. Like, they're doing a good job at dangling this carrot in front of my face. It doesn't feel overdone. Uh, and there's, there, it's, it's, it's kind of cool to have all these little cliffhangers going on. Like, this background mystery. It's not taking up too much time. It's there just enough that you get really excited over it. Yeah. And, and over, and yeah, I, my f thought when they were showing the first parts of this clip was actually like, like this feels pretty quick for her to have figured out the mystery. But at the same time, I appreciate they didn't drag it out because let's be honest, like the temple probably isn't that big. Yeah. Like how, how long could it have taken her to find the sketchy locked door next to the bathroom? Well, they've clearly, they've clearly found a way to have their cake and eat it too, because they didn't draw out her trying to find the mystery. She found the mystery quickly, but she just got fucking kidnapped. Yeah, um, she, she finds the monster in the yeah. cage and then she gets kidnapped. Yeah. So, so like it's artificial length, but it doesn't feel like that because they're doing a good job at kind of keeping the intrigue going on this. Right. Um, and, and, it, and it makes sense that like somebody was watching that door. Yeah. And because it, it, Dario has to have known that she would have found it eventually. And, and, and I also too, it's such a small detail, but I really want to praise they had this really great shot of a car, that a car driving down the highway. Um, and we get like this, and, and we see the car from the side in profile, and we get like this X-ray view of the trunk where we see Black Lotus like bound and gagged, and it's such a little detail, but that's such an innovative shot. I've never seen something like that, like that done anywhere. Like I, I love just the creative freedom that this show gives itself. It, it has so many little touches that, um, that create such a such an exciting atmosphere it never gets stale um mm. just because they're so willing to do all these experimental little things i just appreciate it so much it's so, like that little moment is so indicative of why one of the one of the many reasons why i love lucha so much oh yeah this is very is beautifully shot these all these segments involving mm -hmm. black lotus in these two weeks of her finding the cellar 
And yeah. then she, she gets to talk to the monster. We're still not, we still don't know what he, what it looks like in there. Yeah. I was that. Yeah. I was very aware of the cinematography in these segments, which is not a thing I could really ever see myself saying about a wrestling show. Like I've talked about cinematography before in terms of like shooting the, shooting the matches and making sure we're getting good angles. But like, like, this is like for for promo cutting or I guess Lucha Underground's version of promo cutting backstage segments whatever. I was very aware of how cool the cinematography was for a large majority of the Black Lotus segments in these two episodes. They're treating it like a legitimate movie and I mean I'm not surprised it's a Robert Rodriguez thing so like being very cinematic about this kind of more low budget thing makes sense and making it look good makes even more sense. Mm-hmm. Um but it's still it's still so cool to like they don't phone any of this in and god after being in the goddamn new generation it's so nice oh yeah definitely they make it look effortless it's mm-hmm. it's 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 mind blowing yeah it's really fantastic work mm-hmm. and then so episode 15 her story ends in that part of her getting kidnapped and then episode 16 is all about her being in the trunk yeah. and then like yeah. the, we just like keep the, cutting back to her in the trunk yeah, the, the stinger of 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 fifth of sixteen is it ends with, you know, her, her them stopping at an un, at an undisclosed location, and a guy in a mask who I already know the name of, but I can't say because yeah. they didn't say. Uh, he uh, he he's like, come with me. <laughs> he's taking her out of the trunk. Yeah, which like, not sure if that's sinister or inviting, but I guess we'll find out. Yes. Um, We'll if, have if, to f- wait till next time to know more about what he's doing. Oh, deal is. damn this show for making me crave more always. Uh, damn the fact that I have to wait another month to see it. Ah, uh, uh, curse is the format of our show. Oh, the format shakes fist at clouds. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so that's that's a lot of the that's a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, the promo cutting. Uh, there are a few others that we'll touch on. But to get into the actual matches, god damn. Mm-hmm. There were a couple that were like a little like uh, not, not not like disappointing in any way, but like, you know, short and sweet. We had a uh in episode 16, we had a um Pentagon Jr. match that lasted all of like 30 seconds. He beat up Vinny Massaro, a Vinny Southern Massaro. California indie indie regular. Which is again, they get jobbers on this show who are legitimate. It's so cool. Anyway, um, and we'll touch more on that in a little bit. But um, but yeah, so like we have that, and Pentagon Jr. kicks his ass, obviously. But instead of just vanilla breaking his arm this time, he vanilla he he breaks the dude's arm uh by by yeeting him through a table by the arm. Um, so that's and then fun. he breaks the arm, and then he oh yeah, through and, the table, and then he and then he breaks then he breaks the arm. Uh, which is which is like nice added detail. Hey, it didn't get stale. He's just only, like I was talking getting, about. He's only getting more violent. Yeah, as time goes on. Here. <laughs> I I have to say, it's got to be, and maybe I said this last time, but it's got to be a hell of a contract to be like, okay, you're gonna show up once, get your arm broken by Pentagon Junior, and then you're gonna stay off TV for like several months to nurse it up, and then you can come back and everything will be fine. You can fight actual matches. <laughs> um, damn, there, there got to be some really good like stipends in that contract in order to get people to sign on to that. Oh, damn. Um, but anyway, um. So yeah, that happens. That's super quick. What are some of the other quick ones? Um, because there are a couple. Um, I feel like there was one other quick one. Am I crazy? Oh uh, yes, Tahano beat the sh- yeah beat, beat, beat Superfly. Oh yeah, 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 Tahano versus Superfly was 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 quick and quick and easy. Um, Superfly continues to be an awesome jobber. Again, the jobbers on this show friggin' rule. Superfly is really athletic and really agile. Um, so it's it's just. Again, after seeing jobber squat, bad jobber squashes in the new generation, seeing them done well, I'm all of a sudden like, like issues with jobber squashes. What issues with jobber squashes? This is great. I'm having a great time. This is a great idea. We should do more of them. We should. No, not not necessarily that. They're good at doing them in moderation and they're doing it, making the jobbers actually feel somewhat important or at least somewhat capable. And like Loki has me wishing that like, these jobbers get dubs. I want to see Superfly get a dub. I want to see El Mariachi Loco get a dub. I'm starting to suspect that Pimpinella is just a glorified jobber, but I really want to see her get a du- get a dub. Um, you're you're leaning is. you're leaning to your microphone. Yep. <laughs> that, she, uh, is. she is. No, I want to see Pimpinella get dubs, dude. Um, 
She deserves it. She's a queen. Um, but anyway, um, uh, either way, either way. Um, again, but but that's the thing. I wasn't sure if Pimpinella was a jobber because they make her feel legitimate. They make all these people feel legitimate. If if Austin hadn't told me that Superfly was a jobber, I'd think he was a legitimate wrestler that just hadn't got a dub yet. Like, it, 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 the short matches do not feel like a waste of time, a waste of potential, too short, nothing. We get a nice little showcase, and it's it's used for a very specific plot reason, and then we move on, and it's fine. And we don't overuse the trope, we use it just right, and we do it with actually good wrestlers that are made to feel important to us on both sides. Oh my god, imagine that, putting a little extra thought, and all of a sudden, I'm fine with the jobber squasher format. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, do you want to go in order with the matches? Go yeah, let's go. Let's go in order for all the rest. Yeah. All right. And then, first match: Mil Muertes and Chavo Guerrero. Ah. Uh, the... I, I I think there was an interesting story here. If the even if the in ring wasn't particularly compelling, the the in ring was interesting because so 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 Mill shows up without Katrina, of course, because that whole drama. Um, because there's a whole lot of drama there going on with that. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and Chavo, um, Chavo is, uh, uh, is just the ultimate motherfucker because of course, um, and he spends the first, the first half of the match, just kind of throwing mill around mill is clearly kind of out of it, really being like messed with over the fact that Katrina is not there. And because of that, Chavo just throws him around. Um, and then Katrina shows up, um, and and she uh, um, she 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 drags a rock around. Um, she, and you, first, yeah, she has she has the rock. She has yeah. the rock that is the that is the motivating power. And all of a sudden, I, I noted this also when we were watching. All of a sudden, like. Oh wow, Mil Muertes is really just like a lucha version of of, of Undertaker. Isn't there's he? definitely a lot of comp- there's definitely a lot of 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 compare parallels you can make between him him and the Rock and and the Rock and Undertaker and the urn. and the urn. Yeah. Um, and at first you think she's kind of like there to help him after what happened last week, but instead she kind of like distracts him so Chavo yeah, she, can like yeet him with a steel yeah, she chair. She drags the rock along the apron and that, and then like Mil Muertes is like mesmerized and, and follows the rock. Yeah. Uh, we should, we should clarify, not Dwayne Johnson, just like, you know, his, his normal it is like a, magic rock. It is, a, it is a rock from the earthquake that killed him. And yes, Katrina found him. There's a whole lot. There's all this lore to this to this piece of rock. To oh, this my piece God. of rock that she to this keeps. Piece of rock. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So so another interesting thing, kind of a kind of a an interesting parallel to the um to the Son of Havoc thing, which we'll also talk about more later on here. Um, is a that a whole like, lot of relationship I, troubles? I, I, a whole lot of relationship troubles, and like I kind of ended up feeling weirdly bad for Mil Muertes here, which is not a thing I would expect to feel. Like he's again just getting in that first part, just getting thrown around by a rag doll, and he, uh, and and I'm just like, buddy, are you okay? Do you like need to talk to somebody? Or did... he, he does. His 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 girlfriend is growing distant with him, David. Yeah, he doesn't he... know what he doesn't know what to do. Yeah, he really needs to to stop wrestling and ring and go wrestle with his own emotions in therapy. Um, uh, but anyway, but Mister Thousand Deaths isn't gonna do that. Yeah, Mister Thousand Deaths is is uh, probably one of those like ah, I'm too. Mil much Muertes over. will literally murder Chavo Guerrero instead of going to, instead of going to therapy. Yeah, which which it does turn around in that um, Mill gets the win by DQ. Um, and then he kind of gets a second wind and tries to start beating up on, uh, or no, does he, he, he does he, successfully beat up on Chavo. Oh, he destroys Chavo. Chavo yeah, he gets, just, so it's he a DQ Chavo. because Chavo gets a chair and hits him in the back yeah. that Mill's like, what the fuck, man? What, what was that? Yeah. And, 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 Mil, they, and, and Mill he, survives the chair, by the by. Yeah. And he, he just like, slaughters Chavo Guerrero, hits him with a flatliner onto a chair. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, he and then he, things get uncomfortable. Things again. The the DS relationship of Mil Muertes and and uh, uh, Katrina starts to come out as as Mil Muertes pulls Katrina into the ring and tries to force her to lick Chavo. Yeah, he he demands that which she, is a that she lick of death Chavo, and which and, is Mil, which, and, and she's like and she's kind of like no. No, I don't want to. So first, he grabs her by the hair and drags yeah, and her into like, the ring. Yeah, and drags her over to to Chavo, and then pushes her down onto Chavo to lick him. But she gets up and and she refuses to do the lick. Yeah, which which, and, which I just I just want to throw in there when you've been having jealousy issues with your girlfriend, demanding that she lick uh, a a basically male like uh, a fitness model, um, is a very interesting solution to that. But you know, I digress. Hey, listen, they're into <laughs> licking other people. Ah uh, ah uh, uh, it's a sw- it's a swingers fetish. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So after she refuses, then he chokes her again. Yeah, <laughs> which as I as I joked, this, amazingly he doesn't seem to be lifting her as high as he did before when mm. they were doing it backstage. Weird. Mm. So he's a choke and he choking her. It's Choke. it's really great. It's very oh, com- very comfortable to watch. I love I love being in the same virtual room with my best friend and watching a watching a man, uh uh um uh start to just squeeze the windpipe of a poor of a poor woman uh who is about three billion times smaller than him yep and so he sets her up for the flatliner Mm -hmm. he's about to do it but then don't worry uh white knight phoenix is here (laughs) yep and so phoenix sky phoenix i mean i mean like he kind of is not not in the nice guy tm way but he, he he does a lot of these protecting women angles. I protect woman. The, so, t- the truest himbo on Lucha Underground. <laughs> so he 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 be, he hit he attacks Muertes, saves Katrina, and then and then and then as they're running away, Katrina decides that I guess we're gonna make the affair public now. And yeah. And just starts macking on Phoenix, and I guess Phoenix is into it now. And you can see her lips. Like... You can see her bright red lipstick on on Phoenix as he's walking away. Hey, it works for we're, we're, red. Red is a suitable color for a Phoenix. But no, I I love because Phoenix, like in the past, has just been kind of like confused, like uh, what's going on here? But I guess he's just kind of into it now. In like like we- in the last few weeks, it's become a lot more consensual. He's 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 given it some thought, and he's like, yeah, damn, she's thick though. Uh, and 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 it's like and it's like okay, guess time to, to save her from her abusive boyfriend. And um, Muertes is a fuming. Yeah, Muertes is real mad about this. So he got the he got the dub in ring, but he got the L in spirit. Um, hey. And and the, the L in love. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but yeah. Um, so so yeah, that was that that happened. <laughs> um, Speaking of relationship problems, our next match. Yup, it was. This is this is uh, this is son of ha- havoc. Uh, except no, it's not Son of Havoc, uh, because Evil East has decided that since Son of Havoc is a loser, make loser, losery face, um, <laughs> she needs to fight his battles for him. So she calls out Anna Helico to fight, and things get real interesting. <laughs> right. Uh, not to sound like too much of a SJW. <laughs> oh, but... are we go. We go. We doing a squad W take here. <laughs> but I gotta say. Man, this was awkward to watch. <laughs> uh, a little bit more awkward, more kind of more awkward than 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 Muertes and Katrina five minutes earlier. Yeah, like it starts off because she brings she tells Angelico to come out and Hel- and Hel- Angelico does come out, but he's kind of doing a whole like I don't want to fight a woman thing. Um, or at the very least, I, I-, I want to give him it. I want to try to give him some credit because up till now, and Helico's given himself like some, you know, good graces in my eyes. I, I want to at least think it's like I don't want to fight an untrained woman. Like as far as we've seen, Eva is not a wrestler, so and Helico's just over here. Like I don't want to go toe to toe with somebody who's not like trained to be in ring. Not much um, so of a he, wrestler now. He, yeah, he's trying to avoid her. Um. But she keeps like manipulating him and dicking on him, um, and and you know luring him in only to hit him. Um, 
but then things start getting weird because Angelico kind of starts macking on her. Yeah. Okay. So here, here. Besides that part, like, I'm just let's just gonna break down how I find this little awkward and uncomfortable. So, yeah. First, of course, you get the the you know the implication that Matt Stryker thank is thankfully to make sure that we all understand is happening here is the implication that Son of Havoc is being demeaned as a man because Ivelisse, his girlfriend, is fighting his fights for him. Which is a yeah. whole lot of this blab, whatever, dumb yeah. masculinity shit. But then, then it's just, the story gets kind of muddled, I think, in that Ivelisse is the heel here. She's supposed to be anyway. But then she comes off like the sympathetic person in this match because Angelico just kind of dicks around with her and clearly tries to like mack. Yeah, as David said, he tries to mack on her during the match. Which like I was I was thinking about and un- this. And unlike with Ray Phoenix, she's clearly not into it. Yeah. But like thinking about this, I I feel like I feel like it's supposed to be because this was like earlier 2000s or like 20 early 2010s, right? 2015. 20 Oh shit. Okay, this is 2015. Um well, okay, maybe not as much of an excuse then. But like I almost feel because it's 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 like it's a wrestling show, and as much as I love this show, it's still not perfect on, you know, things, probably. And it's like a Robert Rodriguez production, like, you know, they're not always gonna let... I, regardless, uh, I almost feel like him macking on her is supposed to come off as, like, charming and not creepy, but because Austin and I are filthy uh, feminist SJWs, we, uh, we're just like, uh, yeah, no, this is uncomfy, what the hell? Um... Yeah, and Helico comes off like a complete skis. Yeah. When, again, he's supposed to be the good... Or, or not, I'm not sure he's supposed to be the good person here, but he's at least, but Ivelisse is supposed to be the bad one. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I just don't... It doesn't help. Matt Stryker and Vampire on commentary do not help this at all. Yeah, that's true. Uh, they, they're definitely being kind of weird about it. And also, we also have... Um, we also have, for some reason, Havoc, Son of Havoc off to the side, like, still simping for Evil East the whole time. Like, he's like, yeah, baby, get him. He's um, still support. He's still he's still the supportive boyfriend, even as she is trying to demean him. Yeah. Um. And, and he gets really mad when he sees Angelico trying to mack on her, which, like, I, I have to say, like, I don't see them super playing up, like, the demeanment of his masculinity as this is bad because he is like, he is man. Uh, and this should not be happening to him because the, the, there, there seems to be a, a, a developing aspect of this character. That's like, it's okay that he's a soft boy almost. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I don't, I personally, I don't feel like the show's like stepping into, he's not being manly enough territory. I think it's. I mean, just I think that, that I think that Evelise is expl- is explicitly, you know, played as a heel here. Kind of adds to that idea is that, and she's the one pushing the idea that it's it's an affront on his masculinity that she that she has to be the one to win matches here. Yeah, even though it's self imposed, and even though it's like because she's staking her feelings on him on like what a how how much he wins matches right he um, comes he comes off like the sympathetic character here yeah exactly with a me with this with uh, well vampire called her a bitch on commentary yeah. <laughs> so like the idea is that she's being a bitch yeah. and needs to and shouldn't be so mean to him yeah um which which uh, is his own like kind of i guess problematic trope because like the 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 bitchy hypergamous girlfriend of course we got to do this angle um but it's 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 not perfect but i will say i do appreciate what they do with it uh, in that at the end of the match evelise actually gets the win um she does she, yeah uh, she does get the win which is really funny because angelico spends the entire like match not really fighting her he executes maybe like one sort of move on her but all the rest is him just like kind of dodging and like trying to trick her into downing herself um Mm -hmm. and she between her and son of havoc they manage to kind of bamboozle him enough that she like gets a pinfall on him which is ridiculous but it's a kind of ridiculous i'm willing to live with 
because it creates this angle of like, oh my god, we just gave Ivelisse a super inflated ego because she just downed one of Lucha's one of uh, one of Lucha's most talented high flyers um, without him like you know actually putting up a fight. But because it's Ivelisse, she's gonna like this is gonna make her head blow up to about a billion times its current size. Mm -hmm. So at least. So it's it's a it's ridiculous that she gets a pinfall on him and like totally like unreal. I say unrealistic as if like Lucha cares about realism, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, but it's in service of a of a character angle that I think is going to be fun to see play out. So I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after the match, and Helico decides to keep being skeevy. Yeah, where he's like, where he does the you know, if you want to wrestle one on one again without your boyfriend around. I'm available. Yeah. And it's like, do you get it? He's not talking about wrestling. I, which like, again, it's, that's a weird thing to have a face do. I. <sighs> like, yes, he is ostensibly the face of this ang the baby face in this, in the, between the two of them here. And he's yeah. the one acting like a skis ass. I, 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 it, again, it it feels like they're trying to make it come off as like charming womanizing, but just, that just feels uncomfy. This yeah, day and was age. not was not a fan. Was not really a fan of this of this segment at all. Really, I was a fan of I was a fan of kind of like how it started and how it ended and like parts of it. Again, the fact that like Angelico really wasn't putting up a fight against her, I thought was an interesting angle. Like that's that's an interesting way to like vary up your matches without needing to do all these like different big sweeping changes in like match format it's still a two-on-two -two whatever match or one-on-one -on -one whatever match um but you give it a different format by angelico just being pretty much solely on the defense the whole time so i found that to be interesting it's just some of the like it's like the way angelico was acting was really weird and uncomfy and like please don't make my boy keep doing that yeah and then from there uh i believe at this point we had the tejano interview Yes, which well, I don't think there was a lot of substance there. It was just Not a really. lot. It was, but it was it was an introduction. The idea was to introduce Tejano. Yeah, to after he showed up audience. out of nowhere. Last yeah, time. so to introduce him as like he was a dominant champion in, in AAA for years, and then Alberto El Patron beat him as soon as he came back to uh at, got out of the WWE, and Tejano's like, no, no, he stole that belt from me. Yes, yeah, Alberto stole that belt by beating him by, in a by, match by winning against me. That's 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 your receiver, all right. But he swears that it was stolen, and he's gonna take back what belongs to him. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of the most nothing I think interview that him and him that Vampiro has done at this point. Yeah, it's it certainly I the like like the Brian Cage interview also felt like nothing, but this was short and nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, but I, I I at least appreciated them throwing in the context of like who was this guy that showed up last week and started bull whipping Alberto El Patron. Yeah, that, and then they used the match with Superfly as another way to kind of like introduce him as yeah, a wrestler as an as a as an in-ring worker right yeah so he he and he beats superfly and then here comes alberto yeah to throw oh my hands God. and and throw hands he does he gets in the ring and just starts wailing wailing on tahano uh and to the point where like 10 security guards rush the stage and start like physically restraining him because he's just like He's just trying to 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 basically murder this guy for for, Which, for uh, coming. What in and what the hell? I, they have security at this place. I don't believe you. Yeah, I you know I guess I couldn't put it past Dario to like employ some like co some private contractors for his underground fight club. Um, He's I got will say, cops. Got it. At the yeah yeah yeah. At the end of at the end of episode sixteen, Vampiro says something about uh we have armed guards. Was like I didn't see any of them with guns, so that's gonna be an X for me, dog. But but like I sure we have guards around here. We've never seen them before, but when it's convenient, why not? Now, coolest part with the Alberto Tejano part is when Alberto Tate grabs Tejano's bull rope and starts beating oh, yeah. Tejano bad with with it real bad. Yeah. He wails into Hano with the bull, and then when he's being stormed by the security guards, he uh, 
he he manages to get a hold of the bull rope again and makes them scatter by whipping it in front of him. Yeah, he's just swinging them around and like everyone scatters. And that's when Tejano leaves too, because Tejano yeah. Tejano was like when he when Alberto was getting uh you know re- restrained, Tejano like runs off and like starts laughing. But then the minute Alberto gets the bull rope and like the security guards disperse, Tejano's like Tejano bounces. Oh my god! Immediately. Um, which again, it's so cool to see, to see Alberto, Al Patron, Del Rio, whatever, um, get to be taken really seriously here. Like he was, I was legitimately intimidated by how pissed he was here. I have never felt that once for him in WWE. He's all, he's always been the buffoon here. He's, uh, he is someone to be reckoned with. And I really like that angle and I really appreciate it now that I have some history with him as a performer. Yeah. Um, so that yeah, that that's, that's covered- a ton of fun. I can't wait to see that keep playing out because oh my god, that's gonna be so cool. Nah. Episode fifteen overall for me, because as we've covered the main event already of that episode, yeah. like we already covered the main event there, is that it was just kind of a weaker episode. I liked some of the story stuff, but in ring was just kind of a drag for me in terms of wrestling because you get Muertes Chavo, I didn't I didn't like oh didn't really didn't care for Ivelisse and Angelico, uh Tejano Superflies the Squash and the the uh the trios match with the crew and the assorted freaks as Dario puts it was yeah. was fine but you know obviously it was built around it wasn't built to be like a really good match it was built to be more of a beatdown or fight see i don't mind that that all of the in ring stuff this week or for this episode was really like story focused more than actual athletic focus because we still got some cool moments mm-hmm. um and still little work things that I appreciated. And I really, really like all of the stories that they're setting in motion at the same time, their ability to balance all of these without making any feel like unimportant or, or uh, make any, any making any of them feel like they're dragging or um, making it seem like they're trying to force something. It's, it's, it's really cool. And I can appreciate like taking an uh, taking an episode here and there for the in ring work to be like just direct story progression rather than like rather than like these mind blowing fights. Not every week can be an Aztec warfare, so like I'm fine with that in the in the grand scheme of things, personally. I suppose it helps that the next episode I think in ring was a, was very strong. This is true. Um, so yeah, we open with the sick episode sixteen with Aerostar and Drago getting yes. a rematch from I, I believe last time we watched they did their first match i think so yeah let me look uh yes last time we watched lucha underground was when their first match was yeah so um, and those two together again i enjoy face versus face show-offs for kind of what they are as really getting to see uh uh um athletic ability shown off without too much story baggage um mm-hmm. And this was more of that, of course. Um, um, both of them are phenomenal at what they do. Um, Aerostar, for that mask, uh, it's not like a Sin Cara situation where he like clearly can't see and he's botching. Oh, no. He lands everything. And he lands some tricky stuff. Um, Aerostar is absolutely flies. A, a, an absolute freak athlete. I think he flies he the highest out of all of the mm-hmm. Lucha high flyers. Um, he pulls off some crazy stunts here. And Drago, um, he, again, I, I I will never stop praising Drago's physical performance because the way he carries himself, uh, the way he moves in ring, um, while still maintaining both a, a very admirable physical strength and very admirable uh, uh dexterity um it does make him feel like this really distinctive character um and it makes his in-ring work really stand out and helped by the fact that in this one he's paired up with just one of the best high flyers ever yeah absolutely a uh, great in-ring showing and aerostar picks up the w there Mm-hmm. and a show they have a show of respect and then dario comes out steps out of his office and that is ringside and yeah. he and he's like wow well, like, he, he he plays it off like 
you know, you two seem to have, you guys have great matches and you love each other so much that I will give you, we'll give you more of it. And so he, he retroactively turns this into a best of five where they've already had the first two. Mm -hmm. So it's one to one. And he says that the winner will receive a unique opportunity. Yes. Which is foreboding as shit. Um, but as they always are, as they know. always are. Um, but again, it's the cool thing too, of the disparity between the backstage segments that we see and the, uh, what, what we know the audience is seeing because they're not seeing all of the Dario like backstage bits. Um, so they know Dario's kind of like maniacal and like, ha ha I'm evil sort of, but like they don't really see the full extent. So we kind of get this great little moment in the world where he says unique opportunity um, and everybody gets legitimately hyped about it. And mm -hmm. uh, um, um, uh, Drago and Aerostar, who up to this point have ostensibly not really had to deal with any of Dario's like bullshit, like any of like been the target of his conniving. Um, they're like, they kind of shrug. And they're like, yeah, okay, cool. They kind of um, take it at face value. That, yeah. That this is, that this is all, this is fine. This, yeah. Everything is fine. So again, it creates this great dynamic where, um, no, the fact that this isn't being broadcast out to the world gives Dario more freedom to be this like fully evil, maniacal character. Um, and you know, still get to pull off some of his machinations in broad daylight. And we, as the audience, we, as the TV audience get to enjoy kind of a special dramatic irony of like, no, don't do it. You know, I know it lays on the other end. You don't. Get out of there, sort of thing, and it's, well, a, it's know, a fun don't, feeling. Don't trust the thing that he says. Yeah, it's okay. it's it's a, it's a really fun feeling because we know we know that it's going to end up poorly, but they don't, and it's great how they kind of construct that. So that's yeah. awesome. Oh, um, and I, I I again I just love both of them, and I I I'm a little I'll be honest I was really hoping he would say tag team. Um, it would be great to see them fight on the same side. Um, but regardless, um. I'm still excited to um, to see them go up against each other more, at least. Oh yeah, it's it's we're gonna get three more of these matches. I'm sure they're all gonna be great. Absolutely. Also, patiently await to under to know what the opportunity Dario is offering. Oh yeah, I'm sure it'll be a real doozy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so our next match is is Cage versus Puma, mm. round two. And this match was awesome. Oh my god. This was... I mean, Puma and Cage match up in ring together really well. Um, which I imagine, you know, was very, um, very much thanks to, like, they knew this was going to be a long-standing feud. I would not be surprised if Cage and Puma behind the scenes were putting in the extra work to, like, really perfect their in-ring chemistry. Because, oh my god, it seems like these two were born to fight each other. Um, I mean, Lucha's really good at doing that in general, but like this, especially like this, this feud feels natural. I'm extremely curious to see if they've ever wrestled each other, uh, outside of, um, uh, Lucha before Lucha underground. So let's see. Uh, but while Austin's looking that you, up, like, you, yeah, you can go ahead and talk more about yeah, the match yeah, while I'm looking like, at we get this great kind of back and forth between the two of them because that's what they do really well together. Um, Cage is good at like physically overpowering Puma because again he's thick boy. Um, he's really good at um, uh, taking like Puma, just getting his little advantage points on Puma and just exploiting that to like literally drive the poor man to the ground. And Puma, vice versa, is good at being nice and tricky and kind of getting around Cage and using some of his weight against him. Um, to bring him down and use some of his, uh, you know, slightly more quick moves um, to uh, to outwit Cage, outfox him at times. Um, so it, it, of course, continues to create this great back and forth between the two, and the stakes feel tangible because we know, oh my God, uh, Cage does is not going to quit until Puma is down, um, and if he gets this opportunity. 
um, then we're just going to keep seeing this until Puma loses by Cage's hand. And that's a, that's a scary thought. Yeah. So, so, so Cage and Puma, uh, have, have crossed paths a couple of times before okay. this, but not very often. They've never had a singles match together before this show. It's always been in, in, in larger tag matches. Interesting. Well, like even even if they like never met before this, like even if they're just like b- backstage, like practicing together and stuff, I don't know. Something about the way they fight, the way they move together, um, the the great momentum to their back and forth, it never really feels like it slows down. Um, makes it feel like it, it just makes me feel like man, they're practicing this backstage and they're really dedicated to this and um. Not only are their characters great to pit against each other because it's kind of like the silent hero with his like weird little puppet master versus the like, you know, insane machine uh, that just wants to blow down everything in his path. Um, but physically, they match up well because Puma's not like because Puma's strong enough that he can he can, uh, you know, somewhat match up to Cage's brute strength. But Cage is like that extra bit of brute strength. Well, Puma has that little bit of a, uh, extra agility. Uh, and it's kind of the, um, not just like the physical sense, but like mentally one is I am going to bowl through you at all costs. And the other is like almost Bugs Bunny-ish. And like, what tricks can I pull on you to like trick you into going down in the midst of your little rampage here? Mm-hmm. And and, and, I've, and you get to the like the I think the story stuff with this match is uh, Puma comes out without Conan. Yes, um, they don't really explain this, but I kind of assumed it was just a he was still at the hospital kind of situation. Yeah, same here. And so and so Puma is this is his first time without Conan in his corner, and uh, he honestly puts up a hell of a fight. Yeah, and I think you could you could have told a story. You could tell a story here about you know maybe he doesn't need Conan. Mm-hmm. Like maybe he can do this without him <laughs> which which is which is an angle that i feel like you know is definitely what's gonna come and like we can definitely see see it coming from a mile away but the nice thing about lucha is that they script everything so tightly that even if they have like a clear setup for something they they make it so that you want to see that resolution come you can see it coming and you're looking forward to seeing how it'll play out mm-hmm. so here where we uh, you know obviously have Conan very clearly kind of being a being a harsh uh, a harsh trainer and always speaking for Puma and kind of having his own like plan as he puts it easily he's, he's like he's like this is all part of our master plan um it, it, it you can tell there's some sort of there's gonna be some something that goes wrong in this dynamic um but you don't yeah, know I- what and you're very excited to see what that will be at some point yeah, at, absolutely. The, the tension is only getting worse between them as as how this match ends is Conan does show up by the end, but he basically shows up to watch Cage kind of take over and Cage is just battering Puma with punches again and again and again and again and again. And, again. and eventually Conan uh, grabs a white towel and throws it in the ring. The universal sign of surrendering. And that yeah. ends the match. And that ends the match with the Cage as the victor, and Cage is the number one contender for the Lucha Underground Championship. But and, it was out of out of Puma's hands entirely. And that was a crazy moment because I've never seen the towel thrown in. First of all, and it's very, all, it's very old school kind of boxing com- comes from boxing. It's very old school kind of a kind of a kind of a move. Uh, not not super commonly used today. Yeah, but but like, regardless, it it it, it just just this whole whole thing is exhilarating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I I can't think of a better word. I feel really compelled by this. This is a very vanilla story in a way like you know it's just big evil guy wants to take the belt from nice guy but they write it in such a way that i feel legitimately compelled by it um because they do a good job at making puma feel sympathetic and they do a good job at making cage feel scary i have started to like be like oh shit this guy is serious and i'm kind of really taking him seriously 
And you have Conan on the side doing his weird shit. And he's kind of like this, this, this wild card that you don't know how he's going to affect the story. Mm -hmm. Um, He does a great job at adding an extra element to it to keep it from feeling like the same thing we've seen over and over again on WWE a zillion times. Yeah. Is there something to be said for the fact that despite the, they are two matches and Brian cage hasn't straight up beaten uh, uh, Puma even once, Mm -hmm. but it still feels like Puma he all he still manages to feel like he's that Puma can't beat him. Yeah. Because their first match ends when Brian Cage lets his rage get the better of him and attacks the referee. And the second time ends because Puma P- Cage was trying to beat a man to death and Conan decided to to plead for mercy. Okay. Yeah. Um and something I want to talk about Lucha being able to do really well too on a whole is tension lucha is very good at making you feel palpable tension and i am not really at a point like i would need to like plot out the series in front of me as as it's happened thus far in order to like really get my head around just all the different like moving parts here that cause kind of tension and conflict but they've managed to construct all of their stories in a way that each one has this kind of element to it that is sort of a a a a um Chekhov's gun of sorts something that you can tell is just waiting to go off and make everything fall apart um and that has me really on the edge of my seat with lucha because i find myself um worrying about some of the similar things some some of the same things time after time after time i see mill come out i'm like damn he's lost every pretty much every match i've seen him in so far this is a big scary otherworldly dude he is going to get a win at some point and it is going to be a brutal one we've we're already starting to see like little hints of that um we have um we we have ivalice um you know with her inflated ego and you're like that's come that's going to come crashing down spectacularly we have whatever the hell's going to happen with sexy star uh slash whatever will happen to big rick if slash when sexy star dispatches him to go after the crew we have um whatever the fuck conan's planning we have um we we have the black lotus thing um and we have all the shady little things that dario's doing behind the scenes just because he can because he is he is a maniacal child who revels in his power fantasies. Like yeah, he, just, he, he, I'm I'm always on the edge of my seat about all of the same things because everything's like kind of okay now, but like eh, plot wise, at some point things are gonna come crashing down and it's going to be horrifying, hugely entertaining, like objectively, but emotionally horrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and right now that tension, it feels like Puma's days as champion are numbered. Yeah, he's a huge... Because he can't can't keep finding ways to to not really lose to Brian Cage. Yeah, Um, and we still are watching him being puppet mastered by Conan. And... uh, you know that's gonna go wrong somewhere. Yeah, I'm almost mm-hmm. betraying myself for like a uh, 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 an Iago or Judas level like betrayal here of some kind, just by how Conan acts, how power hungry he is. Um, th- it's not just about the fighting. It's not just about the the story scenes. It's about the overarching story. It's about the plot the true plot of everything that's going on here. And it causes me to be at the edge of my seat, even in things like episode 15, where the in-ring stuff isn't like insanely good in-ring stuff. I still feel that tension. and That's why it still grabs me. Yeah. Um, after a uh, cage Puma, it, there's the Pentagon match. And then you get the main event, uh, Johnny Mundo and King Cuerno. King Cuerno. And this, this might have been my favorite match that we've watched this this week. Um, 
because I love Mundo and Quirno again is starting to become scary to me. The relentlessness with which he dispatches people. Um, it was really funny. He gets an early uh he gets an early pin attempt on uh on on Mundo, and of course Mundo kicks out of it. And it's it, he he kind of pins um uh pins Mundo by the arms and the torso. But uh, and and I made a comment to Awesome. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, okay. Try to try to pin Mr. Legs here by the by the abdomen. That's a smart move. And then after I said, almost as fucking if Quero could hear me through time in the TV is like starts gunning for Mundo's legs again. Attention to detail, and it makes Quero a really terrifying opponent. He is. He is. He is relent. He is relentless. He is focused. On on his hunt, and he wants he wants Mundo real bad. Yeah, and here's the thing about the arc Mundo's going through right now. It'd be really easy to make him just kind of like continue to get clowned on by all these people and kind of make him look like a bitch by by comparison. But they don't let that happen. They let Mundo still continue to feel cool. Like he gets he gets knocked around and his leg is continuing to be battered after the injury he sustained in the last like in show week. But everything about uh, uh, about the way he fights uh, in this in this uh, this particular brawl, he keeps coming back with this relentlessness. There's this kind of like reckless abandon to how he moves, especially as the fight continues to go on. He's just constantly his mind is racing. He is he's strategizing. He is trying to find in whatever way he can to get rid of this threat to his person and that's what it felt like a legitimate threat to his like person mm-hmm. his well-being and it was so cool to see those two go toe to toe with mundo standing up to the relentless hunter yes and i think that that as a the threat to his person it didn't feel like Querno really wanted to win necessarily i think that's how this the finish plays out that's why he's that- so scary is that he hits he hits Mundo with the arrow from the depths of hell once, and then he gets Which up so cool. and he does it again. Then he gets up and does it he a third it a time third on the time. steps. Mm-hmm. And basically, what happens is they're both down and they're the rest doing the count. And Cuerno gets up and he's about to get into the ring, but at nine, Mundo gets back up. And Cuerno turns around. It's almost as if he could have won. He could have rolled back in the ring and Mundo probably doesn't make it back. But he didn't want to win if Mundo was still standing. Nope. That mattered more to him than getting a, a win in, in his in his his win-loss record, in his in his column. Oh god. And they basically go back to straight fighting. And like even as they say this is a double count out, it ends in a draw. They're still just beating the hell out of each other. Yeah, and, and that's the cool part about this fight. It extends past the ring, and they just go into a street fight outside the ring. And this is like, oh, this is personal, and this is brutal, and this is no longer about two dudes fighting each other for fun and profit uh, in a sport. These are two men who hate each other trying to do in the other. Um, and it added... I don't want to say gritty realism because that's such a meme to say, mm-hmm. but truly it added something to the fight to like retroactively make it feel even more emotionally involved. By the end of that, I was just, my head was spinning at how it kept going and going. Mm-hmm. No, it was, they, they were, they fought all over the temple. They, they fight all the way up the stairs you know, they get, they, they tease like somebody getting thrown over the balcony. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was really hoping to see because, because they're, yeah, they're up on the balcony by, by, by the end of this. Um, and at one point, um, Mundo has Querno up against the, the kind of rails on the balcony and then vice versa. And I'm like, I need somebody to go over this balcony right quick. Now, to be fair, they probably couldn't because like fans are for the most part. There's probably no real way to do that safely. But, Oh, that that'd be so cool to see one of them get knocked down into mm-hmm. um into the audience below, um just because the other can. That's the best part. It's like they're both 
driven, like driven by very different things, but they're both kind of personally similar in they both have goals that they're striving for and will do anything for. Um, and we get to see a physicalization of that on this match that just kind of lets you really appreciate the the uh, um, deep feud that's building here and what it physically amounts to. Oh my god, it's just such a good match. Yeah, and it, and it all ends with uh, eventually Mundo and K and and Cuerno take themselves through a a cage kind of set up in the back where they have a lot of like production boxes and stuff. And they like go going through like a cage wall to knock each other out, and that's yeah. that's that's the the ending image in ring. Of course, they the real end of sixteen is this stuff with with uh, Black Lotus in the car, but. Yeah. As, as the final image, as the announcers are saying, "We'll see you guys next week," is is them just both crumbled on this cage wall, yes. having destroyed each other. Yes, it's so. And it just leaves you with the question of what are they going to do? What are these two going to do next? Uh, and that's I don't I don't know. This is Lucha taking. I I haven't seen this rope really played out yet like sure i've seen messy endings and curb stomps and stuff i've never seen things devolve into a full-on fight that takes its own like set of five minutes that is not resolved by the end um Mm -hmm. so this is about to get really ugly and i trust lucha i think i think for me at this point it's really safe to say i trust lucha to to handle um the sort of dedication that it would take to really commit these guys to an intriguing explosive long-standing feud Mm. definitely just overall great stuff to end out our our episodes this week oh my god i love lucha dude like I, I almost worry that these Lucha episodes are getting stale because it's just like me just constantly being like, I fucking love this show. I love this show so much. Let me just gush more about how much I love this show. Hey, hey, Boston, did I mention that I love this show? Like, like it's just every not, time not I find new, new, new reasons to deeply enjoy the Temple at Boyle Heights and Lucha Underground. Incredible, incredible stuff that I am so, so happy we get to enjoy every another, few weeks. Another week of thinking maybe we just become a Lucha Underground podcast. Seriously! I'm just happy we get to, like, we're basically just watching this show through because this is consistently good stuff, and I'm hooked on this story. It, mm-hmm. God, I'm hooked on all of these stories. No other wrestling show has done that for me. I am hooked on every single one of these storylines. That is an impressive thing to do, and... I I'm just so excited for when we get back here. Yeah. And so to try to get you hooked on another ah, one of the wrestling story, ah, a great transition. Is what we're ah. doing next time mm-hmm. is next time we travel on our way back to 1996. Our first mm-hmm. storyline outside of WWE, well, excluding Lucha Underground, but you know, and AEW. Well, that was a one-off. But our first trip of a of a real like regular wrestling storyline outside of WWE mm-hmm. is is good old WCW. Oh, oh by good old Ted Turner. Ted uh I'm in the wrestling business Turner. Yep. We're we are in the thick of the Monday Night Wars. And due to some fortuitous contract situations two of WWE's top stars became available right at about the same time. We are going to start May 1996 Mm -hmm. with the birth of the NWO, the New World World. Order. I'm excited. Because, hey, you want a war? You got one. I am really excited. This is something that, like, has been in the background since we first started this podcast. Austin mentioning this here and there, the WCW and the NWO, these mythical things that I have never had any sort of meaningful interaction with whatsoever. So to see this pop up 
as a storyline we are going to follow through, I am excited to to get to experience this whole new thing mm. um, and see what other companies outside of WWE were doing in the late 90s. Yep, I'm very excited as well to, to jump onto this WCW train. Oh, good shit. Oh, now, David, it is time to hit our plugs. Absolutely. My wonderful friends, thank you for traveling with us all the way out to the West Coast to join us for another episode of the Noobs and Knockouts podcast. If you are a returning listener, welcome back. We are so happy to have you back with us, uh, and we are glad that you have enjoyed us enough to keep sticking around week after week. If this is your first time joining us, uh, first of all, welcome. We are so happy to have you as well. We welcome noobs and knockouts alike, whatever you may be. We hope you're having fun. We hope you continue to keep joining us. If you would like to keep joining us and you are not entirely sure how to do so, let me tell you right now. One, you subscribe to us on YouTube, the noobs and knockouts podcast. You hit that subscribe button. You ring that bell. Like and comment and add us to your playlist and add our, our playlist to your list of playlists. Um, we, we have all of our storylines that we followed. Uh, broken up into uh, different playlists for your uh, ease of listening, thanks to uh, the diligence of the lovely Mr. Austin over here. Um, and uh, we would just love if you checked all of that out. You can also find us on three of the best places to stream your podcast, and that would be Spotify, Apple, and Google. Rate us, follow us, whatever it is on any of the platforms to to keep up with us, uh, and to let us know how you think we're doing, and to tell the algorithm that, hey, these guys are pretty cool, all right? Maybe you should, maybe you should, maybe you should promote them a little more. Uh, uh, give, give them some of those, some, some of those, some of those uh, 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 boosts in the in the algorithm. Huh? All right, all right. Just just a little little favor between you and me, you know. Here's um, that engagement. Yeah, yeah, the engagement, mm, a sweet engagement. We thrive off it is our lifeblood here at the Noobs and Knockouts podcast. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. We have a Twitter at Noobs and Knox Pod. That's Noobs, the letter N, Knox Pod on Twitter. Uh, we tweet out memes. We interact with the broader wrestling community. We tweet out every time an episode drops. We follow news. Uh, and of course, the lovely Austin uh continues to live tweet his wrestling viewing. My friend, what is on the schedule coming up? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, after the massive success of AEW Double or Nothing, great Ooh. time just had watching that show. So, as always, we'll be cover. We'll be doing live tweeting of all Elite Wrestling Dynamite live on TNT at 8 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday nights because it is the only pro wrestling show that I watch weekly and on a regular basis live. And of course, let's monetize all of my wrestling viewing content yeah in addition uh we'll usually live tweet the le the uh pay-per-view specials for aew impact wrestling and wwe mm. uh and upcoming in the month of june coming up in only a mere merely a week from the date of the from the day of this episode dropping nxt takeover in your house Mm -hmm. live on june 13th and so far we only have one match on the card that's fine we got plenty of there's plenty of live of tv episodes to go but so far we know it will be carry on cross the nxt champion versus either johnny gargano kyle o'reilly or pete dunn for in a singles match for the nxt title then one week later we have wwe's Hell in a Cell. Oh, big on one. June 20th. And so far, we got two matches for that. We got Rhea Ripley, the champion, versus Charlotte Flair for the Raw Women's Championship. Very soon, David is going to have a better understanding of who Charlotte Flair is. Uh, um, any relation for a to couple any, of episodes down the line. Any relation to Rick? Yes, that or Charlotte oh. is Rick's daughter. Oh shit, buddy! Yes, and then and uh, and then you have for the WWE Championship will be Bobby Lashley or Drew versus or versus Drew McIntyre or Kofi Kingston, which really showing off when we air this thing because they're having they're settling that tonight on Monday Night Raw. Oh, but they one of the oh, one of those two oh. men will challenge for the WWE title. Wait, hell wait. In hell. Wait, and oh, heck in a sec. I have to. I, 
I, I have to play D and D tonight, but I might record Raw because I want to see a Kofi match. Oh, please, 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 please. Yes, that is what is upcoming next month in June. Outstanding. So be sure to check all of that out. Austin is great at the live tweets. He tweets out some really funny stuff. He tweets out some really great uh, analysis and insight. Just good stuff to check out all around. We also have an email, uh, noobs and knockouts podcast at gmail.com. That's noobs, the word and this time knocks uh, or no, pardon me, noobs and knockouts pod at, at gmail.com. Pardon me, noobs and knockouts pod at gmail.com. The word and this time, please. Uh, if you if you like the show, you want to interact with us a little bit, send us email. Tell us what you think. Uh, uh, um, uh, give us suggestions for the show, things you want to hear us cover. Um, um, uh, just shout out the things you've liked so far. Uh, tell us how how uh, lovely and beautiful you think our voices are. Uh, we just love hearing from people. Uh, and if you want to reach out, that is the most direct way to do so. And we'll always we'll always want to kind of uh, uh, write you back and say hi. Um, and finally, you can find us on Patreon. You can subscribe to us, the Noobs and Knockouts Podcast, on Patreon. One dollar a month gets you early access to episodes and a shout out at the end of each episode. Yes, I want to throw this out there because this is our first episode since we got we got an update on the invasion from Planet WrestleTopia. Ooh, ooh, is, exciting, exciting. There has been in the last few in this past week, we have had a Kickstarter campaign. I had mentioned this previously on um, when we did Invasion from Planet WrestleTopia, a Kickstarter to have a print edition of the series is available is now it is up on kickstarter just search for suspicious behavior productions invasion from planet wrestletopia and if you liked what you heard on our podcast if you liked what you heard on our podcast um you and you would like to uh pledge money to this campaign it's going for till the end of it's going till june 24th um then please do so uh, Tell you what, I'm gonna go. I'm about just, to go pledge to that shit right now. Hey, same. Yeah, I just noticed. That I just, I just uh, happened to see this email. So next time, I'll have a better preparation for being able to sell this at the end of the pod. Nice. But yeah, that and, and so 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 be sure to check us out uh, wherever you can find us, and we are uh, very much looking forward to all of you joining us next time. Absolutely. See you guys then. Hasta luego.